Okay, well, welcome everybody to you for attending this seminar. Uh, this is another seminar uh, within the PQ Chiefs initiative of the National Cryptologic Association, the Chiefs, uh, but differently from the periodic seminar uh, we organize online. This one uh, is organized at the Polytech University of Marche here, where we are hosting uh, Eduardo Persichetti for a scientific visit. So he's going to lead the seminar here. And at the same time, uh, we would like to share the seminar with everyone interested through Zoom. So thank you for attending both here in the room and uh, online through Zoom. Uh, Eduardo does not need to be introduced. Uh, he was already uh, hosted in, in, in our seminar series, uh, uh, but uh, uh, nevertheless, uh, uh, despite uh, many of us already know Eduardo, uh, it is important to say that Eduardo is uh, uh, one of the uh, young, important researchers in the area of code-based crypto. Uh, he's working in this area since a long time. He's uh, involved in many, in several uh, um, candidates to the ongoing MIST competition, including finalists and alternate candidates. Uh, he gave several contributions in this area, uh, especially in the design and analysis uh, of uh, signature uh, and uh, as well as encryption schemes. Uh, today, in particular, Eduardo, uh, Eduardo nowadays uh, is uh, uh, within the Florida Atlantic University. Uh, and today uh, we'll give a seminar about uh, code-based digital signatures uh, concerning the state of the art, the open challenges and some uh, promising avenues for designing efficient uh, digital signatures based on codes. So thank you Eduardo again uh, for being here and for your seminar, the stage is yours. Thanks Marco, I, thanks for the introduction. Thanks for having me, thanks for saying that I'm young. And uh, so I will stay here so you can see my face, although I recommend that you look at the slides. Okay, and um, okay, so yeah, so today I want to talk a little bit uh, about uh, code based signatures and in particular about some new innovative frameworks that we are working on and we've come across. And I think this is particularly important, so I will start with an introduction uh, to the area and, and, and try to explain why. The, the existing solution essentially have not worked for a long time and then now we're trying to do things differently and uh, why hopefully this works better out better yes so <clears throat> actually i don't need this uh, so uh, i will give an introduction as i said then i will present the traditional approach to to signatures and and so to code based signatures uh, and then uh, quickly introduce uh, zero knowledge protocols and describe these new frameworks that we're working on and then we will draw some conclusions at the end and see, see where we get. So the introduction, which is my classical introduction, is that uh, you know in, essentially in a few years we will have uh, this this uh, miracle of quantum computers. Uh, and once this happens, uh, the current cryptographic standards will not be up to par anymore. Right. So the idea is that we have to start now to prepare for the future, especially in certain contexts where the desired secret needs to be for a long term. And so NIST uh, issued a post-quantum cryptography standardization call. Now, already seems like it was yesterday, but uh, Marco knows it was a few years ago, in 2017. And uh, th this call encompasses several areas of research and we work on code-based cryptography, which is one of the most popular, so I would say the, most, the, the second most popular after lattice-based crypto. Uh, so in fact, what we can say now in 2022, after five years is that code-based cryptography is doing really well for encryption and key establishment. We have three finalists in this process, and I'm proud to say that I am part of all three of them. And uh, Classic McElise is one of the actual finalists, and I think he's next to standardization. And by Kenneth QCR was called uh, alternate candidates. These are a bit more experimental sort of schemes with uh, shorter keys because they use quasi cyclic structure, right? Um, so we'll see what happens with that. But uh, in the meantime, you know, we can say we have at least three credible candidates. So like one more conservative and two more experimental ones for encryption and key establishment. But unfortunately for code based signature, it's really not, it's not the same. We had only four submissions to begin with. Code based CAMs or encryption schemes were a dozen or more, uh, but uh, of the only four submissions they are all broken or withdrawn. So there was really either 
no secure, no efficient scheme, no way to do a, a good uh, signature scheme back in 2017. But we really need signatures, right? And right now we only have lattice signatures and multivariate signatures. And there have been some problems with multivariate signatures very recently. They've been broken, one of the finalists. So we really only have code based signature scheme, uh, lattice signature schemes. And, uh, you know, obviously we need, we need signatures in the modern world, maybe even more than we need the key exchange or at least the same level of importance. So what can we do? Can, can we actually fix this? Because NIST itself is very worried that we can only have two signature schemes that are lattice based and that's it. So it would be nice to provide some alternative. And so here is what we, we do. We work on, on linear codes just to make sure we're on the same page. Um, linear codes, traditionally, you can see them as, uh, as vector subspaces of a certain dimension of, of a, a vector space of length n over a finite field. And uh, again, traditionally, we measure this with the Hemming metric. So we look at the non-zero positions. This gives us a weight and a distance between words. And we can think of uh, overall over correcting codes as of linear codes as, as defined by uh, essentially a basis, right? Because we're talking about vector space. So we put some vectors in a basis. This becomes a matrix. We take the rows of this matrix to be our basis vectors. And this is what we call the generator matrix. So then we have, in fact, several choices of, of generator matrix because we can choose any change of basis will give us a different generator matrix. In particular, we can choose the one that we call systematic to have the identity on the left. This will reveal uh, exactly the, the information symbols, right? On the other hand, uh, the parity check matrix defines the code as a kernel. So we take the code words to be all the ones that satisfies these equations that are given by this matrix. So you can imagine it's a, it's, a, it's a product here, H times X, which we call syndrome, and the code word as syndrome zero, yeah? Similarly to the generator, we have different choices for, for the parity check. And in fact, we have one particular choice in systematic form that is directly related to the systematic form of the generator. Uh, but why are we talking about error correcting? Because the, the, the secret ingredient, the secret source is that we have a decoding algorithm that can correct a certain number of errors. So this is the entire idea of, of codes as part of communication theories that they are used to correct errors, yes, in communication. So, <clears throat> uh, so why do we like them in cryptography, right? Because in general, it's hard to actually decode a code that is random. So if I take any matrix K by N, this gives me a basis and defines a code. But in the overwhelming majority of cases, this is not gonna be a code that, I, that has a decoding algorithm to see the tweet. So if I know nothing about the code, all I see is a G and a vector in the space, uh, find a code word uh, that comes from this Y. So what we define as the general decoding problem is what's the closest code word to this? Or at least close within this radius. Yes, this W radius. Well, this corresponds to correcting the W errors on the word. This is hard. And uh, in fact, more often than this, you see the, the equivalent version, which is what we call syndrome decoding problem, uh, which is represented with the parity check matrix. So if you give an H and a, and a vector in the space and you fix a weight, uh, find the word E such that the syndrome is, is Y. Yeah, this corresponds. You can see that the two are immediately equivalent because if you take the, the, the code word with errors, you multiply by H and the syndrome of the, of the code word is zero goes away and it corresponds to to the syndrome of the error, right? So you can see these this formulas are equivalent, but syndrome decoding is easier to, to formulate and to study. Uh, Berlach and Michaelis and Van Tilburg proved in 1978 that this is amplicomplete. complete. We have a result about this syndrome computation being in fact a pseudorandom generator. So if you, if you compute syndrome of random vector, it will give you a, a random string, right? And we have a QRE version of, of, this, of this proof as well by Barg in, in 94. So it's a strong problem, right? And we have a unique solution under a certain threshold. I don't want to speak too much about what's called the GV bound, that this gives me a unique solution. And uh, as I said, it's a very well studied problem. It has a solid security understanding. Uh, the information set decoding family of algorithms is generally what is used to tackle this kind of problem. So if I know nothing about the code, all I can do is look at information sets, which is what will reveal where the errors are. Right? So it's some sort of glorified search algorithm with some birthday tricks in there and some, some efficient uh, lists and, and, and tips, but essentially this is the best that we can do. And it's very well understood. So, uh, you know, talking about ISD as can be confirmed by, by my colleagues here would be an entire talk by itself. So all we can say is that we have a very well understood definition and complexity for information set decoding algorithms. And in fact, this is not really an attack anymore. It's just the way that we choose parameters. So we can, we can very accurately estimate um, what happens with, uh, with this. 
So what do we miss? Uh, we miss the, the secret sauce, right? We, meet, we, we miss the, the trick that, uh, that we need in cryptography, which is, so we want to use these hard problems, but we want to have a tractor because the, the, the full idea of public cryptography is that we have something that, uh, that is private then the public doesn't know. So we need one ingredient because on one hand, it's hard to decode random codes, but on the other, it's easy to decode the codes if these are special codes that have a decoding algorithm. So if we assume that uh, a properly scrambled matrix is indistinguishable from a randomly generated one of the same size, this M can be the generator, it can be the parity check, even it can be the non-trivial part when I have it in systematic form. Uh, then the hardness of this assumption depends on what code I'm choosing. And so if I'm choosing a code that is defined through certain elements, uh, it may be easier or harder depending on how much structure I'm, try I'm trying to hide in the code. Yes. So what we do is we choose a code family that has a decoding algorithm, and then I hide the structure, right? And this is going to be exactly my tractor. So the authorized user will be able to decode. But the, the general public will only see a public code that looks random. And because it looks random, the only thing I can do is, again, apply ISD or try to solve the single decoding problem, essentially. Um, so here's the traditional approach. Uh, we use the traditional signal decoding based structure. Uh, and uh, again, traditionally signatures are, or at least back in the day, uh, what they did with RSA was, okay, we'll just do, use the top to right? So when you, when you first explain, oh, what's a signature scheme? It's essentially like an encryption in reverse. When you encrypt, you take the, the public key, you create some ciphertext and the private one is used to decrypt. When you, when you sign, you do the private thing first. So you, you take the message, you have your one-way function, your trap the one-way function, and you, you, have a, you need to use a hash function for security reasons. You, you first hash the message and then you apply the, the, the trapdoor to it, essentially. So it's kind of like you decrypt, you decrypt it. Yes, this will create a signature because then the signature has to be publicly verifiable. So you use the public key to, to verify, right? So you verify simply by applying the, the, the function to it. And if this checks out with the hash of the message, then, then the signature is valid. And otherwise the signature is not valid. So it's really kind of like a, a weird take on almost like an, an encryption in reverse if you do this kind of technique, which is rightly called the Hessian sign. Again, this is what they do for RSA. In the case of RSA, the idea is that you do X to the E and then Y to the D and you, do it, you first do the, the X to the D. And anyway, it's, it's basically the same thing, right? For us, it's not exactly the same thing. And this is kind of what the problem is, right? So for code-based crypto, the trapdoor is the decoding algorithm as we have just seen. And, uh, and this leads to what is called the CFS schemes after the, the name of the authors. So I'll show you how, the, how CFS works very quickly because it's very intuitive. You, you select your hash function to give you an output in the space that you need. So this is the syndrome space, if you want. Uh, your key generation will select a code. For example, GOPA code is what is used by Michaelis originally and is still the, the choice behind classic Michaelis, for example. So it's like the secure choice here. But it can be any code that you know do not give away the structure. Uh, you keep your private description here, and you public say even the systematic form for it, right? This is as scrambled as any. Normally, you do just do some permutation, some some change of of basis. Anyway, uh, so to sign, you compute the hash of the message. This will give you again a potential syndrome, I should say. Uh, you then try to decode it and get the corresponding error vector. Uh, you can do this because you have the decoding algorithm for it. Uh, if there is some transformation like a change of basis or something, you can remove it and then you apply the decoding algorithms where vice versa. Again, this depends on what kind of codes you're using and how you're scrambling them. In the end, you end up with this vector. Okay, so supposedly finding this vector is hard. And so this means that forging a signature is hard. Right? So to actually find a signature is, is, is hard. No one can do it because they would have to like decode random code. Okay, so your signature is basically this, this random error vector. And then to verify is very simple because you just Take the vector, compute the syndrome, and if this is, e is equal to the hash of the message, then uh, the signature is valid, and otherwise you reject. So this is great, uh, right? So what's the problem is the problem is like I, I gave myself away, like here you have to try to decode. And I also said like, this is basically a potential syndrome, right? So one thing that is very well known in coding theory is that decoding a random word is not always possible, right? So you don't quite have a full domain like the name of RSA suggests, it's called full domain hash. Like when you have a, a group and you just take a random element, you can always compute a power, sure. Uh, this, this is not true for, 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 for code words. So 
here there is this this pretty picture is, is the best one I could find for this these spheres but essentially every code word has a sphere around it with a decodable radius uh, but these definitely do not cover the space in fact that this empty space in the middle here is much more than the decoding radius around the balls so if you were to like randomly like put these balls on a piece of paper and just like try to hit it right most often than not you just see something that is not uh, close to a code word and this is a problem because if you try to decode a random word most likely you will fail so all you need to do is try again and how much do you have to try actually quite a lot so what you do is you just head a counter uh, to the input so you, you try to hash message zero and if this works great otherwise you try to hash message one and if this works great and otherwise you keep repeating and then you just transmit this so you can do like a educated attempt to the code but you still have to do a lot of decoding so these are McAleese parameters from the original 78 McAleese uh, encryption scheme that is able to correct 50 errors and you will see that uh, with a simple combinatory calculation, you just need to do the 216 decoding attempts on average to, to find a decodable syndrome. Right? So obviously, this is impossible. Uh, so these codes here, you see that the, the code rate, the, 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 ra the ratio of dimension to length is about one half. This is technically what we use in code-based cryptography for best results on hardness against the various attacks. But you, you know, it's not written in stone. So in principle, you could change this and try to, to optimize the parameters. For example, you can choose codes. You can see that they are very high, right? Uh, the length is say two to the 16 and the dimension is only a little bit less than that. So very far from half. This obviously is a very bad code. You can only correct nine errors, but then you only, only need nine factorial decoding attempts. So even with this really bad code, you still need a lot of decoding attempts. And uh, what this results in is, you know, this is your code length, two to the 16, right? Uh, your, your, your code's binary, this is the number of errors you can correct. The public key is very large uh, because you have to give the entire matrix here, public check matrix, right? So this, you cannot escape. It's a trapdoor based scheme, so you have to publish this matrix here. And uh, it's a common problem in, in code cryptography, the fact that you have to publish this, this big matrix is what uh, sadly McAleese is kind of known for. Um, the signature is very small because you're just sending little error vector. But you know we are doing this for 80-bit security level, which is kind of outdated. Maybe this was OK in 2001 when the scheme was proposed, but right now the standard is kind of 128 bits. So even would be bigger parameters than this. And especially, the signing is very slow. So if you have to try this many decoding attempts, uh, even you know I would like to say that there is no, there's no way to, to early abort, say, the, the decoding attempt other than try to decode. So it, it's going to be very slow because you try many times. Right? So if you have a huge key, very slow signing algorithm, it gets worse because the code is very high rate. So now it's not so hard to distinguish it anymore from a random one, actually. Yeah, so we have a distinguisher that was published in 2013. This is not straight away an attack, but it kind of invalidates the assumption that the code looks random. Yes, so you kind of can recognize it. Uh, it gets even worse. So uh, Blake and Bakker published an attack, generalized by the attack, we meet in the middle thing. So the previous parameters actually were not 80-bit security. So now for 80-bit security, you need 15, 12, uh, rather than the nine that we had before. So even bigger code. And this is, again, still only 80 bits. So we're, we're increasing, we're increasing, we keep getting bigger. Now the, the implementation that we that we show secure, the last works were, were given in 2013. And if you don't know uh, Nicolas Andre, Daniel Bernstein, Peter Schwab, this is the creme de la creme of, of implementation people in the area and uh, so their implementation are the best you'll find around and show several seconds for producing a signature and gigabytes of public key so it's it's, it's completely impractical right <clears throat> now there is a recent approach uh, from a few years ago that tries to use high weight decoding I will not spend a lot of time on this but uh, essentially instead of choosing a very low weight error which is a very high weight error. And then maybe you can play around with the same idea of using the trapdoor, but the features are still similar. So what we have, we have slow signing, we have to have some sort of rejection sampling or anyway, try to the code and the, the key is large, right? So you will see here, these are parameters of the wave scheme. The code is ternary, gives better performance and security, but still is a very long code. Uh, uses this u u plus v construction you can look it up but essentially the the dimension is split into two yes is there's a u part and a v part and you see the weight is very high so it's like almost full length 
uh, this leads to a 3.2 megabyte public key for uh, 128 bits of security. So it's it's uh, more than twice the public key of classic McLeis uh, for level five category. <laughs> so it's it's very very large key with a small signature, but it's also you know it's like relatively small, but not super super small. And uh, you know the implementation that we have, of course, showed that the signature is is quite a slow process. So this doesn't look it just doesn't look like we're using the the right tools for signatures. And this is where zero knowledge protocols um, come into play. I'm a big fan of zero knowledge protocols. Um, so here I will quickly introduce the area and uh, and then see why I think this works better and what we can do with it. So what's a zero knowledge identification scheme? It's it's kind of like a little bit of magic. It's it's an interactive protocol to show to someone that he knows a certain secret, right? But you do this zero knowledge, which means that you actually don't reveal anything about it. So you, you can efficiently convince someone that you know something and he will know nothing more about that. You ju he just learns that you know this, but he doesn't learn what it is. It's, it's really like a magic thing. And it usually goes like this. You, you have a private key is what you're trying to convince the knowledge of, what they call the witness. And then the verifier is some public data that he uses. You, you commit to a random data. So you, you just kind of promise, okay, I'm gonna work with this. And then you get sent a challenge. Okay, then answer this, this question, right? If you really know the secret, you should be able to answer this. And then you produce a response that somehow involves your secret somewhere, but it hides it efficiently. Okay, so you send this to the verifier, the verifier will use the public key, it will verify it publicly, but it uh, will learn nothing about your secret. Then you can accept and reject. This is great. So if you build a scheme properly, an honest prover will always get accepted, be able to prove. Or at least with like some overwhelming probability, there's maybe some small probability of failure. But you know, in general, we want the scheme to be correct. This is always the first requirement. Uh, on the other hand, what is called soundness, in my opinion, the most important aspect of these kind of schemes, you have to show that they, they, an impersonator, so someone that wants to pretend that they know the secret, has only a bounded probability of succeeding. And when I say bounded, you can you can bound it from below and you can bound it from above as well. So you can really say like, okay, here. The best you can do is you can cheat maybe with some certain probability, but like you can bound this. So you can define what's called soundness of the scheme. And, uh, and then there is zero knowledge, of course, which is fundamental, right? So no information about the secret key is leaked. Or again, maybe we can relax this to, to some sort of you know, condition. But in general, you shouldn't give away your secrets. Even to an honest verifier. Yeah, this is, this is, the verifier for this is treated like any, any onlooker. You just look and you learn nothing, OK? So how does this go into signature? Um, you can transform these things into a signature scheme if you use this fantastic uh, transformation that was introduced by Fiat and Shamir in 1986. Um, what they prove is that if you transform your, so the signature scheme is of course non-interactive, right? So you have, you have your document, you sign it, you send it over. There's no interaction with the, with the verifier. So what you do is instead of getting a challenge from a verifier, you produce this challenge yourself with a hash function. So you commit, you then hash your commitment and message. And this is a hash. So it guarantees that it's kind of like a random challenge, right? Then you form your signature by sending the commitment and what would be the response to the protocol. And then the verifier verifies in the exact same way, just that he doesn't get to choose the challenge. The challenge is like automatically produced. And so with this simple idea, you get what is called a existentially affordable signature scheme. So once you have a zero knowledge identification scheme, you can transform it into a signature. Like it's just, you push the button. Of course, there's you know, proof machinery behind it, uh, but, uh, but this is the idea. So people focus on building um, zero knowledge schemes. In fact, this is a very efficient method. It leads to very efficient schemes. Candidate Deletium, for example, for standardization uses exactly this idea. Um, you have very strong security guarantees. Uh, it's zero knowledge. So by definition, you learn nothing about the secret. You don't need any trapdoor. So I don't see where any leakage, you know, like because you prove these properties, right? Once you prove this knowledge, this knowledge. So it's very strong. Uh, you also, and we will see in a second, have some some guarantees about randomness. Uh, in fact, you can entirely avoid the decoding. You don't need a factor anymore. All you need to, to to use is the fact that finding these low weight words is high. So you can really rely directly on 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 signal decoding properly using random codes and exploiting the hardness of finding the way. So this is what Stern did in 93. I want to show you the Stern protocol. This is kind of like our starting point. Hash function ever present, right? Choose a random code now. 
binary code in Stairs protocol. Select your secrets to be a low weight word and publish the syndrome. This is going to be your public key. So public key is also like a lot smaller. I right? just have to publish a syndrome. You do not need to publish H because H is random. And therefore, you can just store, for example, the seed they use to generate it rather than the entire problem. So this is, it, it kind of like solves another problem, which is that you don't need a big key anymore, right? And then the protocol is this is interactive. Your commitment in this case is, co is composed by three pieces. You can commit to uh, a random permutation and then the syndrome of Y. So you choose some random, right? Commitment was like you, you choose a random data to commit to. So you can commit to pi and syndrome of Y. Then you commit to pi of Y. And then you, you see here is where you put your secrets. Uh, you commit to Y plus E, you permute it. Send these things to verify. The verifier will send you a ternary bit if you want, like a 0, 1, 2. And then you either reveal Y and pi. With Y and pi, you can verify the first two commitments, but not the third. With Y plus E and pi, you can verify C1 and C3, and et cetera, et cetera. So with pi or Y pi, we, you can verify the other two. In this case, you also have to verify that the response here has a correct weight. And so you're always able to answer two out of the three commitments. And you can quickly see that this is zero knowledge, right? So Y and pi are fully random. Y plus C, pi here is random. Y plus E covers entirely uh, the error vector. You're just putting a random word on top of it. And here you send a permuted version of the random stuff, OK? But you also send a permuted version of E. Again, permuting a vector, a binary vector, it doesn't reveal nothing. It just reveals what the weight is, which, which you kind of already knew. So it's, it's, it's clearly zero knowledge. Uh, so what the problem is not the zero knowledge. The problem, the problem is that uh, the soundness is very high. Uh, so here we have a soundness error of 2 thirds, which means that uh, a cheater can pre-select a strategy a priori to fake it. And then if he's unlucky, in one of the three cases, he will not be able to answer. So he can say, OK, I will choose a random y and pi. And then instead of answering correct, so I will answer correctly c1 and c2, because I can build this. I don't need the e for this. But for c3, I will just hash pi of x, where x is some, some vector that solves this equation here. And well, this x is, is enough to pass verification in the first two cases. But if you are asked b equal to, then the strategy fails. Right? So with two thirds probability, you can actually fake it. And if you choose a different strategy, you can instead answer zero and two or one and two. So in all cases, you have two thirds. And if you have two thirds probability of succeeding, so the honest guy will always succeed. The impersonator will succeed two thirds of the time. So there's a little discrepancy there. You then have to kind of exploit this, right? Obviously it's not good enough to, to succeed <laughs> with, this, with this kind of authentication level. So you really want to repeat the protocol many times. And if the, if the verification is successful every time, then you can assume that the verifier, that the, the prover is actually what it claims to, to be, right? And of course, if you turn this into a signature scheme, you have to transmit all of the repetitions, which the signature becomes very long. So this is, you know, like the, the, the soundness error leads to a very long signature. Uh, these are the original stair parameters. Uh, I think this last set we kind of extrapolated with the original stern scheme. You can see that it grows really quickly. So for a very low level of authentication, you have like five kilobytes signature. When you start to go into 80, it's already like nearly 100 signature of, of, of 100 kilobyte of signature, and then it explodes when when you shoot for high for high security levels. Uh, these are the code parameters. You see the codes are relatively short, but uh, the number of repetition gets really, really big. Okay, so I mean, over the years since the original still proposal, we had many variants, and the main goal of all these variants was to decrease the sound set. Because there's nothing, there's, there's a lot of good things about these schemes. The only problem is that the signature is very long. I mean, clearly not 100 kilobytes of signature, right? But uh, if we re reduce the soundness error, then we can have better results. For example, the CVE scheme, this one uses QRE codes and, the, and, the, and the, the error is given by Q over two times Q minus one. So it's about one half when Q is large enough. This means that we need less repetitions, right? So this is efficient when you choose a large finite field. This is the CVE scheme here. It's a little bit different, but same idea. Here you have a QR code. Again, you publish a syndrome, and you use monomial matrices rather than permutations because you're not just uh, moving things around. If you just move things around, you will reveal what the coefficients are. You also want to scale them. So monomial is just a permutation with some scaling factors. You just multiply the coordinates. The Hamming weight doesn't change, but then you you don't give away what the value of the coordinates is anymore. And uh, you know the, here the scheme is a little bit different. It's a, what we call five pass. So there's two interactions with the verifier. 
but the idea is the same. See, like you publish here essentially a masked version of, of your error, and then you, you permute it slash you, you apply your isometry to it. Um, there is some, some algebraic equation here to verify using the public key, and here you check the weight. So it's kind of similar to the Stern scheme, you know, to change a few things and they can prove that the soundness is that one. Okay, this works better because with soundness one half, you need less repetitions. Um, but, you know, uh, essentially the signatures you obtain are still too large. So if all you can do is one half, the best you can do is like 30 kilobytes or something like this. Maybe you can apply some tricks, sending some, for example, if you send a random stuff, you don't need to send the actual random stuff. You can send the seeds or you, know, you, can, you can play around with it, but it's still fundamentally like too many repetitions. So Marco, you call me when I'm late. Huh? So the idea, you know, the idea is still valid. Essentially what, what comes out of this after looking at this for long enough is that you really need a better protocol that gives you high soundness. If you have high soundness, then you need fewer repetitions and then by implication, the, the scheme will be very short. So there is this approach that we call MPC in the head that emerged relatively uh, recently in the sense that the initial work by Ishai et al. in 2007 was purely a, you know, an MPC theoretical structure. And then recently uh, they started applying it to build signature scheme. And the idea is that it's in the head in the sense that the prover simulates an MPC protocol. So it's multi-party computation. So it will create many shares and then uh, the idea is that some of the verifiers checks are independent from the secret. You just use the public key and you don't need to check the weight or something. So you can offload this computation beforehand to some sort of trusted authority, like what we call helper. And so you, you kind of pre-process a whole lot of stuff and then you get asked to open one or some of it anyway, because this is a multi-party computation scheme. If you open a partial amount, that doesn't reveal anything about the final one, right? So you don't lose security if you open some of these pre-processed things, because only if you have the entire sum or the, the entire collection of, you can reconstruct the secret. But this means that you have a much larger challenge space. So if your challenge is a single bit or something, then of course you're gonna get one half or something like this. But if your challenge space really pinpoints which one of the many shares that you prepared you want to open, then your sound is gonna depend exactly on which one. And that allows for a large sound. Yes, so the general idea should be clear that like I, I just kind of make like a large pre-processing with a lot of options. And then I'm asked to choose exactly one of them. And you know, essentially to, to, to cheat like the guy was doing before, you have to figure out exactly which one you're gonna be asked. And, uh, and this is the, then the probability is like exactly one over, right? So in principle, it doesn't need to be one, but one is, is the simplest thing you can do. You just open one and, uh, and this does not compromise the, the security. So here is the protocol that we designed a couple of years ago now, or maybe more recently with, with Shageron and, and Dr. Santini. Uh, and, uh, you know, we, we basically started from the CVE scheme, but we say, oh, it's, it's a QRE scheme is the best one that works. Uh, let's use a commitment scheme. This is what you need to use rather. It's like a stronger, say, stronger version of hash function. Yes, it's like a hash function with like extra strength properties. Uh, so what we do is like the helper will generate a bunch of y plus e. If you remember, this y plus e was the response that we had before. Is the is the mask on top of the vector? Now this is not your secret because the helper cannot know what your secret is. But he will generate some random vector of the correct weight and then mask it. And you see, each of them depends on what value of of challenge you choose. So there's like q different elements in the finite field. You compute all of them, and then you you you, you put together this call. You hash them, put them together in a collection. You then send the seed that you use to generate this randomness to the prover and you send this collection to the verifier. And when you prove yourself, what the prover will do is, okay, I will get the seed so I can reproduce whatever the helper was doing. I figure out what's the isometry between these two. This is easy. And I send my commitment to the verifier. The verifier will ask me to open exactly the one corresponding to element C. I will do that. And now you see, it can verify the algebraic part. This is like in the CVE scheme. But to verify that the scheme was, the, the, the response was correctly formed, this doesn't need to be done interactively in the protocol. You can just check that this Z was one of the previous ones that you were sent. So you guarantee that this is correctly formed. You don't need to send, uh, check the weight, right? So you, you will just see, oh, this was, it must be formed correctly 
because otherwise the hash of it would not be among the collection that I have, right? So this is kind of like, okay, I had two checks before, now I only have one check because one, I can do it in the head from before. So if you look at this, to cheat, the only thing you can do is try to pre-prepare this thing, but of course you have to guess what C you're going to be asked. And so the, the standard is one over Q, where Q is the dimension of the field. Now, if you choose a large field, then you have like a large soundness and you have much fewer repetition, right? So that was the, the entire idea. Hopefully um, you are convinced. Uh, so what, what about this? So of course, here we have a helper, magical helper that will do all this pre-processing for us and it has to be a trusted authority that we know will not cheat. And so it will give the prover the seed and we'll give it, this is not realistic, right? But I can simulate this one if I use a cut and choose. So the idea is that I do this many times and then I only use one of them, right? So I, I do this say M times, I prepare this collection M times, and then I'm only asked to open one of them. And this gives the sound of error, which is one over M or one over Q, whichever is the, is the largest one. Yes, because one over Q is the one that comes from the protocol. And then if the attacker is guessing which one of the setups is going to be used. So you, you choose a, a Y and an E tilde, you do all the pre-processing, then you choose a different Y, different E tilde, you do all the pre-processing, different Y, different E tilde, do all the pre-processing. And then you have all these different collections. You see this AUX that is here. You have a bunch of different AUX that you send over there. And then he selects one of the AUX to use. And then you do the protocol with that AUX. And again, to fake this, you have to guess which AUX is going to be asked. So it, it, this is what we call the, the cut and choose technique, right? Uh, and so in the end, now you, you've removed the helper. Right? So you can simulate, you can show that you are a real prover by saying, uh, uh, okay, I have all these setups, ask me one of them. On, on one of them, you will do the protocol. On the remaining ones, you just give all the seeds, and you can verify that they were correctly formed. Right? So there's a lot of computation. Um, but at this point, you, you have a, a normal zero knowledge scheme without the helper. You can just apply Fiat Shamir to it, and it becomes a signature. As I said, it's a lot of computation because you have each collection of the outs is a lot of hashes. And then you do this many times. <laughs> you think that this M and Q normally are about the same as something like 256. So you have 256 hashes in each collection that you do 256 times. So it's obviously crazy, but you can kind of get around it. If you use like Merkle trees, then this, you know, it's logarithmic, so it, cut, it cuts a lot of the computation. Then you, you know, your seeds, you can also organize in a tree and there's, there's really like a lot of transitions that we try to describe as accurately as we could in our work. And this yields smaller signatures, but you have increased computation. Of course, because you have to compute a lot of stuff. So the signing and verification has to be quite slow. Uh, here are our parameters. You see that if we choose say 512 setups and Q is, is 128, we execute 23 out of these. Then we get 27 kilobytes of signature, which is already an improvement over the, the literature. The public key is always very small. It's not even a kilobyte. It's like 10 kilobytes is, is great. Um, if we choose more setups, then we have to execute fewer of them. Makes sense. It's a combinatorial, a simple combinatorial argument. But the signature gets smaller and smaller. We can push it, say, below 20 kilobytes. Of course, the computation gets larger and larger. Now I'm, I'm really computing a lot of setups. And the hash, you know, Hash function is fast. Now, a lot of, a lot of hash functions are not so fast. <laughs> okay, so it's, it's really a, a trade-off here with the implementation point of view. So we can do better than this, yes. Uh, so this, this, if you want, I can see it as like a first step into getting a, a new framework with a high soundness that we published in 2020. I want to say, Paolo, correct me. But it's very expensive at about the same time. A work came out from uh, Fener, Jou, and Rivain that uses the MPC in the head on directly on the permutation. So rather than pre-processing all the collections, what they do is this. If you remember Stern, so it, this works for binary codes. So we started from CVE, they started from Stern. What do you do in Stern? You reveal two things, a permuted error, error because this reveals nothing about error other than the hemming weight. And then you reveal the masked the masked error with the with the word on top, right? These are the two things that you can do to to. Well, if you choose why to be a code word rather than a random word, then when you compute the syndrome, 
it goes away. So the verifier checks the, the, the syndrome of this, and this is the, equal to the syndrome of E, so it should be the public key, yes? And then you check the weight of this thing. Okay, so essentially this is the same as showing that you know a permutation and a, and a code word, right? So first you check the code word, and then you check the permutation satisfies this. So P of E tilde should be V plus P of Y. This is just the equation. Okay, but to show this existence, you can prove it. So the form of this one, the fact that this is a syndrome, again, you see now this is a syndrome of a random code word. You can do this via cut and choose. There's no secret there. So you do a pre-processing phase to cut and choose to show that uh, the Y is correctly formed. And this one, you, you, you define an affine transformation, which is permutation plus, so A of something is permute something and add a random mask on top of it. Okay, so then A of E tilde should be permute E tilde, which is this, and add a random mask to it. Well, now pi y is also random. So if you group together pi y and r, this is a random q. You can fix this ahead of time, say this is trusted, and then you just have to show that a of it is equal to v plus the trusted thing. That was the clever idea of, of the of the Fenerich Urivan paper. Uh, and the fact that you use MPC directly on this, this affine transformation. So you don't have just one affine transformation, you decompose it into a nested affine transformation, one inside each other. You then reveal only one of them and verify that that one is correctly formed. But if you don't have all the other ones, then you, you, it this doesn't reveal anything about the secret essentially. Uh, this leads to slightly better result. You see, uh, signature is now 16 kilobytes, executing 28 setups out of 389. Uh, the time complexity, which was the issue, is also much faster because you're not doing all the big pre-processing phase with all the hashes, um, that saves a lot of time. We can do even better, in fact, because the problem is still that we are using these isometries. We're still revealing permutation of permuted vectors. We don't want to do that. So here's the, the last uh, idea that we are working on and is to use polynomials. So if you write your matrix in systematic form, you can actually split your error vector into two parts, right? Uh, and then the first part, EA, uniquely determines the other one. It's just an equation. Okay, so let's select a large field F poly, right? And we can give an ordering to it. So this gamma one gamma n is just ordering the finite fields element. Uh, and then we can build a polynomial. So this is the clever um, idea by interpolating the points gamma i with the positions EI of the secret vector. So the idea is always that you're trying to prove that you know a vector of a low weight. Right? Up to this point, what we've been doing is give some permuted version of it or some hidden version of it with some mask on top. This was kind of good, it gets even better, but we can do even better if we completely move away from permutations. So now I'm going to transform essentially my syndrome decoding problem into a polynomial. Here I get a polynomial that essentially, because I interpolate, has roots corresponding to the elements that correspond to the error vector positions. Okay, then we build a polynomial that has roots corresponding to the non-zero positions of the error vector. And then S times Q should contain all the elements that I am working with, all the gamma elements together. So effectively what you do is you do S times Q, this should be equal to, so you do really you do Q times S and then you calculate the polynomial F, which is the product of all these, these uh, linear terms for all the so this gamma, gamma i, i from one to n. So you then put it, so that contains all the roots there. And then you define P to be Q times F uh, divided by F. Right, this is just the equation here, <laughs> linear equation. Uh, so if Q times S divided by F is P, then Q times F is F times P, and then this is Q times S minus PF. So what you want to really show is that you know polynomials Q and S and P and F such that this equation is equal. And the degree, see, you see here that the degree of Q is W and proving that the error vector has at most, I mean, weight W corresponds to showing this equality. There. So with this bit of uh, magic, we are transforming SDP into a purely polynomial. Process. So now, instead of proving that I know a vector of error weight W, I'm proving that I know polynomials this and this so that this equation is satisfied. And this is completely equivalent. So now I don't have to work with the coding anymore. Basically, since the coding is only in the setup, and then I immediately move away to polynomials and I just work with polynomials. And I don't need isometries anymore. I only need to prove things about polynomials, which is much better. How do I do this? 
I use the MPC. So I create some shares of the error vector so that there's some correspond to the error. These are additive shares. So I create a bunch of random vectors so that their sum is the target one. Easy. I then, for each of these, compute the interpolated polynomial, right? So I do this always like locally for shares. Again, this, the prover is doing all this. So then I'm going to ask some of it. Uh, because the Lagrange interpolation is linear, when I sum these interpolated polynomials, they will correspond to the interpolated polynomial of the error vector. So I can do this all on the shares, right? I do the same for Q and for the product PF. So I'm doing all, all of this on shares. How do I prove that Q and S are equal to P and F? I don't do it on the polynomials themselves. This is the other bit of magic. I actually do it using some random points. How do you show the two polynomials are equal? Well, they kind of they, are, they have the same value when I evaluate them on a bunch of random points. Okay. If your field is large enough, there is very low probability of collision. So if your field is small, you may have some false positives. But otherwise, if you take a large field and you evaluate the two polynomials on the same points, and they always are the same value, well, then they must be the same polynomial, right? So that's the trick. Uh, this is what is called the schwarz principle lemma. And so you need to take an even larger field. So it's called F points is an extension field of F poly, and where these points live, and you evaluate your polynomials at this point. You don't do it on the actual polynomials, though. You do it on the shares. So you compute these shares. You evaluate them at points, you multiply, you do all of the shares. And then in the end, you use some standard MPC techniques to verify that this product is equal to that product. Uh, there is a lot to unpack. Obviously, this is kind of like a more like a survey <laughs> talk. I could give just an entire talk on this protocol here. But the idea is that you see, I'm just, first of all, I'm just proving things about now. I'm just focusing on proving things about polynomials. I'm proving that some polynomial is equal to some other polynomial. That's the first step. And I'm also doing it in kind of like an efficient way by selecting a bunch of random points. And in fact, it's only five or six points that you need to select uh, by the condition of the schwarz lemma. Then you're happy that they are equal. Okay. Uh, after this point, you have the usual thing. So you don't have the helper anymore, right? It's all done on the shares. These shares simulate the fact that you have the helper. So you do the cut and choose. Uh, you, repeat, you repeat the scheme enough time. Here, your soundness is going to be given by a formula similar to the previous ones. Kind of Kind of, uh, kind of like that one. You apply five sham here, Shamir, and you get a really, really competitive scheme. So these are the parameters of the scheme. You start with, they have some binary parameter sets and some QRE parameter sets. On the binary code, you have usual length, say about a thousand uh, with 100 error, 132 errors. You take F poly, so your polynomial lives in F to the 11, and you have the degree two extension of it, and you just do your computations in here in F points. When you evaluate the polynomial, this leads to 11 kilobytes of signature by executing 256, sorry, preparing 256 uh, setups, executing 17 out of them. With the same setting, the QR code, much smaller, is a large QR code. Uh, the F poly can be the same, it's, it's large enough so you can accommodate the points in there. But when you, when you calculate the polynomials, you extend uh, degree three. This again has to do with the probability of cheating, so you need a large enough extension field there. Uh, this leads to like say 8.5 kilobytes of signature is very small and all you're doing is linear operation on shares and some interpolations and some polynomial evaluations there's no there's no crazy operations there anymore there's some hashing sure and stuff but uh we can actually improve this so when we saw this scheme when we actually saw the previous scheme the share permutation one kind of appeared at the same time as our GPS scheme. We started talking to, to Antoine Jou and his group and we said, oh, you know, it's really promising. Yeah, it's really promising, let's work together. So with my postdoc Tovo, we, um, we brought an improvement to the scheme using linear complexity, which I would really like to talk to you about. But the idea is that if you move from the single recording to the polynomials, you don't need to interpolate anymore. You can just start with the polynomials in the first place. And you can show that this is equivalent to the single decoding problem, essentially. So we have a reduction from this linear complexity problem. So if you have a finite sequences of a set of linear complexity, this is the same as finding a hanging weight of a set of low hanging weight. Um, and so this avoids the interpolation, which was kind of like the most expensive operation in there, because you have to do all those interpolations during the, the pre-processing phase. But we don't need interpolations anymore. And in fact, the query, the query parameters can also be refined. So this was kind of like a first step accurate parameters and instead we sat down with, with Paolo and with Toho and we said 
you know, we can actually choose better parameters. So if you refine them, I don't have them here, but you can choose for the same Q2 to the eight, better code length and weight and, and finite fields and stuff. And we can push a signature to something about seven kilobytes. At this point, you have a signature which is seven kilobytes long with essentially no public key. And this starts being really competitive with respect to uh, anything that is not lattice signatures, essentially. Um, Sphinx or any other hash based schemes, multivariate schemes. But also, lattice signatures, last time I looked, is something like two kilobytes of public key and two and a half kilobytes of signature or that sort of realm. So maybe, like, if you consider their sum, which is a standard metric in something like TLS, it's maybe like four or five kilobytes. We're really not far. We need to show that we're fast enough because we are. So, you know, you can do more setups than this. You can do 1,024 setups, and then maybe your kilobyte, your signature is like six and a half or six or something. You can push it, but then you have to do many more setups. So, there is again an implementation sweet spot to find. Uh, I'm working with Shageron, like I did in the past for many years, to, to bring this to like a high performance. Of course, you are doing several things. At the same time, you can parallelize. There's many implementation tricks, but the idea is that we are working on making this truly practical. If we can show that this is fast, size-wise, we are very competitive. And this is really something new for code-based cryptography because the, the, the panorama up until a few years before was uh, desolation. We're talking gigabytes of public key, right? Everything that we've seen so far, or like 100 kilobytes signature. So in a few years, we quickly took this idea of zero knowledge. It works, but the soundness was not high enough. Let's push on the soundness. This allows us to have very high soundness. And then, you know, the GPS was already like a first, okay, we have high, have high soundness. Yes, but it's very slow. But now we can do it actually in a very clever way by shifting away from the, the setting of error vector and using isometries and instead using these polynomials. So what can I conclude from this? Finally, we are starting to see some truly practical code-based signature schemes. I would say, depending on the application, even 12, 13 kilobytes, it's something that looks like uh, amazing compared to what it used to be before. But now if we have seven kilobytes, it's, it's uh, even better. Uh, this MPC in the head approach will basically circumvent what was the, the only one problem, is really the Achilles heel of zero knowledge schemes. The, the standards was not high enough. Uh, there is another line of research, which, I, which is why I'm saying that we are having some solution for code signature. It's not just this, right? We have some work that kind of does the opposite. We really just want to use just the isometry to, to build the schemes. Uh, and again, it could be its own talk, but uh, there is a scheme that we developed in 2020 with, with Paolo Santini and, and Giacomo Michele in front of Francois Bias, and then we further refined in the following year. The uses code equivalent, something that is right now apparently very popular uh, because uh, there is an equal notion in several other areas. Uh, for example, isogeny based cryptography is just about this, and even lattices are doing this thing now. So, you know, we can use isometries to prove knowledge of a secret, which is fun. And we can do things in a very different way. Uh, there's a lot of work to do in research. So if you are in research, this is a, a great time because to, to build efficient code-based schemes, there's a lot to do, right? To design them, to optimize them, to crypt analyze. Just look at the last two years since we designed less, the follow-up of less, the GPS scheme, the two schemes by Zhu and other people. There's a lot of design effort, optimization effort crypto analysis effort, of course. So we are trying to build this up to speed and right, to be competitive and, and hopefully something that can be standardized in the future, at the very least, like an alternative to lattice schemes. Uh, we can also investigate many advanced frameworks. Right? So basic signatures are great, but as, as you may know, if you use blockchain or other things, you need threshold signature, composable signature, verifiable signature, multi-signatures, identity-based signature, etc. Uh, so, you know, it's not, it's not enough to have just a normal signature scheme. Sometimes you want to have like a ring signature where many people are trying to sign and they have to do it in a fast, efficient way. So then the tools are great. You have to combine them in a different way. And so there's a lot of effort going into this again, something that we're looking at. Um, so this is what I had to tell you. I'm very excited about signature schemes. I was from before for a long time. It used to be a barren landscape and now we have all these efficient, uh, promising things, exciting things. So um thank you for your attention i'm open